Listen, there's a lot going on in these streets, and I'm going to tell you what I'm not looking forward to now that L.A. is open. It's running into all you Karens that are out here pissing off the world. <laughs> I don't know, Damage Blue, if you saw this, but uh, LeBron James was playing a game, and Karen had somewhat of a courtside seat. And now at the Lakers game, for, I guess they were playing Atlanta. I don't even watch this game, <laughs> the basketball, basketball game. But I don't even watch the NBA, but uh, LeBron apparently – was out there playing, and then things got personal with him and some guy. Uh, this guy was rooting for the other team, and so he started yelling at LeBron, and he allegedly responded back. Now, the fans ended up being escorted out of the game. Of course, somebody was there with a phone. This is what happened. Take a look. That's the fuck up. Hey. Don't talk to my husband like that. Oh. Who the hell is that? Hey, and they're blaming you. That's a joke. Let's go. Now, the girl is 25 years old. Her real name is Juliana Carlos. She's been dubbed courtside Karen. <laughs> she <laughs> she went over to her. She's 25. I mean, it's it's L.A. So she's 25, and she uh, took to her Instagram to explain what happened. So I'm minding my own business, and Chris has been a Hawks fan forever. He's been watching the games for 10 years, whatever. He has this issue with LeBron. I don't have an issue Le with LeBron. I don't give a about LeBron. Anyway, I'm minding my own business, drinking my wine, having fun. All of a sudden, LeBron says something to my husband, and I, and I see this, and I go... I stand up and go, don't f talk to my husband. And he looks at me and he goes, sit the f down, bitch. And I go, don't f call me a bitch. You sit the f down. Get the f out of here. And I go, don't f talk to my husband like that. Don't talk to my husband. And he literally was like, f bitch, sit down, bitch. And all of a sudden, now I'm getting kicked out. Excuse me, I have courtside seats that I pay for. F LeBron, you're here. You're going to let a 25-year-old girl intimidate you during a game? Bye, bitch. Now, the only thing I heard was silicon, um, plastic, and privilege. What? what uh, and, and she should have ended it with, and that's on Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> there is so much caucasity in that clip. I, 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 why? 25, though? I mean, okay, hold on. Let me... I'm a black woman, so maybe that's why this is not computing. She's 25 human years, years, years old, right? 25. She looks like a like a steady 36. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I will say this: I, if LeBron said that to her, that kind of gives me life. I am not a fan of misogyny, but I feel like she might have deserved it. However, I love the fact that she's claiming that LeBron was cussing her out and this, that, and the other. And when they cue to LeBron, he's like unbothered and saying that his direct deposit hit. So you know, stay mad, Karen. Um, this is all very silly, and I really, really think she needs to get her seats taken away forever. Jason. Call him a pussy. <laughs> Do you know how entitled you have to be to heckle an athlete when there's no one else in the stands? Like, when you heckle an athlete, it's like a group think kind of movement. It's like we're all screaming at LeBron. For one or two people to be screaming at LeBron courtside and think nothing's going to happen, that is the epitome of being entitled. Like, what the hell did they think was going to happen? And LeBron guess James. what? Sports... Sports fans heckle the, uh, the players and they talk back and that's it. She's jumping in as a non-sports fan, making it more serious than it probably was. So that's a whole L. All right. Well, listen, I, I, she sounds like uh, she's full of hot air. Um, and she looks pumped <laughs> full of hot air. So I, I don't know. Um, for me, I just, I'm just going to say there's a lot of, there's too many allegedly's in this story for, to, to pick a side. But I will say if you are courtside and you scream at a player, because that's what you think the entertainment is for you. Don't be mad when they turn around and give it back. Now, speaking of speaking of checking, my girl Rihanna just checked the hell out of Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron. Now, you remember he's the black guy who is over the Breonna Taylor uh, situation in Louisville, Kentucky. He's the attorney general for the state. So he's the one that can bring charges and bring closure to this madness. So on the first day of Black History Month, uh, the Attorney General Daniel Cameron, he shared a video on his Twitter in celebration of Black History Month. Now, we all know he's a black man married to a white woman and hasn't done shit uh, uh, for the Breonna Taylor case. And this was the video he had the audacity to post. General Daniel Cameron, today marks the first day of Black History Month. For the next 27 days, we take time to remember 
and celebrate the contributions black Americans have made to our nation. Now the road hasn't always been easy, but over the course of our country's history, there are countless examples of black men and women whose talents, contributions, and determination have altered the fabric of our nation and put us on a path toward building a more perfect union. I know that I would not be here in this office, serving as the first black attorney general of the Commonwealth and the first black Kentuckian independently elected to statewide office, if not for the giants whose shoulders I stand upon. So today, and for the entire month of February, take time to learn about the countless contributions of black Americans who have made the Commonwealth and this country what it is today. Thank you and God bless. You could tell by his lips that look just like the girl from the last story's lips that uh, it was gonna be a Mary with a little lamb for me. I, I'm embarrassed for all the people that came before him that it so-called ushered him in. I, he just disrespected all of them. It's like, damn, bro, you are the biggest letdown. And I'm just glad that we don't have short memory with this one. And I'm glad Rihanna, mm -hmm. megastars like that are stepping up and calling this dude out because that's just nasty. That whole PSA after the Brianna Taylor situation is just nasty to see. I don't understand. And maybe it's the narcissism for me that is a little hard to digest because you're so full of who you think you are that you don't see yourself for who we see you to be. And uh, but I'm glad, as as you mentioned, damage Rihanna, who y'all know, I love Rihanna. She had to put him on blast. And this is she retweeted it. I think we got a photo. She retweeted it and said, sup, hashtag justice for Brianna Taylor. I mean, to me, she said everything that I think we all thought of. Right. Mm hmm. Uh, so for the, the case of uh, Brianna Taylor, he wasn't just in charge. He grossly and egregiously allegedly mishandled the case where there was opportunities where there could have been more justice for Breonna Taylor and he didn't advise or push for it. So he literally had a moment where he could have advocated for this black woman and he chose to look in the other direction where the other coons were hiding. So for me, um, Daniel Cameron, he's lucky that's all Rihanna said because I would have said a whole lot more. He is a coon in my opinion and he stands on the short shoulders of Ben Carson and Herman Cain and uh, he does not have the right to even say Black History Month because I feel like he might have gotten drafted and forgot and thought that he was still part of our community. I cannot think And black him. people, black people, this is where hashtag protect black women uh, matters, right? Why are you not online lighting the internet up? Why is, Rihanna was the loudest voice in this disparity of, of his reality and the reality that we all know. This is where we have to stop, get, get out of the hip hop game, get out of what's going on on uh, social media with these celebrities and their relationships and pay attention and police when black women are not being protected. This was another just case of him putting insult to injury. And I, for me, the issue that I have is, I just don't understand what it's going to take for this girl to get justice. Are we gonna be talking about this in 20 years? Is he gonna do some big uh, interview on Good Morning America 20 years from now saying how he got it wrong? And then are we gonna be looking back, reflecting on how we didn't hold him accountable to get it right? I don't trust this man, he's a coon. And that's how Mary had a little lamb. <laughs>All right, listen, I'm so excited. We have gospel legend Marvin Sapp here. And look, before we get into that, you know I'm in these streets full of tea and there's so much going on that I got to get into it. But before I do, let me just say that I'm down 105 pounds and I love all the love that I'm getting from my fans who are telling me that I should be on OnlyFans and I might have a surprise coming up for y'all soon. <laughs> wait, what? what? <laughs> wait. <laughs> That's a good wait, turn. Wait. Too many announcements at once. <laughs> I was celebrating the weight loss, and you said OnlyFans. I'm like, actually, actually, is we have a God fearing legend in the gospel music here, and I lost a lot of weight to prepare me for my OnlyFans. Me and my God will have to deal with all that later. I've been on my whole healthy journey, you know, still focusing on my health and fitness, and I hope and pray that everybody that's out there protecting themselves from COVID-19, whether or not you're getting the vaccination or not, I hope that you are focused on being safe, staying sanitized up. Damage blue, I'm not getting the, uh, the vaccine. Are either one of you? Do I want to get it? No, but I want to be responsible. Um, I know for my son to go back in school, we're going to have to get it. So as a responsible uh, member of the L.A. community, I'm going to have to get the vaccine. I, too, am a responsible member of the L.A. community, and I will do so when they give me an equally valid reason as what they gave damage. Like, I don't get the first iPhone. I'm not getting the first version of the vaccine. I will get the vaccine. I'm just not going to be 
in the front of the line, but I will be getting it. And I think we all know why the black community has a long history of wanting to be cautious when it comes to the government putting anything in us. So I, 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 I personally that. feel like there needs to be more trials. I need to see if more people yeah. grow extended arms. I know somebody DM'd me and said that me questioning the vaccination is doing nothing but adding to the problem of more people dying from it or the extension of this period where we all are quarantined. But for me, I just feel like there hasn't been enough time to see that this thing actually works. Um, the way that it's intended to work in its full capacity. So I'm just too terrified. Am I still traveling? Am I still living my life as normal as I can with this pandemic? Yes, I am being more cautious, but I mean, I don't know. I, right now, I just don't feel safe enough to do. I don't feel like there's been enough information. Man, I hear you. If it wasn't for the school thing and all these little curveballs, I would probably be more hesitant. But at the end of the day, you know, if it's the right thing to do, if, if it helps get kids back in school and everything, then I'm just going to be on board with that. Um, but yeah, I feel you, Jason, wholeheartedly. Your kids are going to go back to school because if you don't, DFS or whoever, DCFS is going to show up and take them out. I mean, you know, I know that you, you know, and I guess from your perspective, there's more to think about, right? Because you do have a small kid who does have to go and be around a lot of other people. But what safety precautions are you taking to make sure that it's actually safe for him to take it? That's the thing. It's like it's it's being forced and they're not talking about it now. So, you know, I'm just waiting for more information to develop. But that's the scary part. It's like, OK, when do the kids have to take it? Because that's the rule. So you the kids have to go to school, which you like, just like you said, but then they have to get the vaccine to go. And then we have to get the vaccines because we're parents. So it's kind of like we're in a vice grip, but I'm just waiting it out just to see what's happening as, you know, updates come. But I'm with you and I'm with Blue. I don't want to take it. But, you know, it got to be responsible. Got to do the right thing. And I also want to say to the person who gave you that feedback, I think it's a little bit irresponsible to shame people from a community from having honest dialogue about wanting to unpack their very complicated and valid feelings around the vaccine. So anybody who's trying to shame people in taking the vaccine, you can advocate for the vaccine without shaming people for asking valid questions. So let's not do that either, right? Like the conversation that Jason's trying to have, that we're all trying to have, is valid. And when you tell people, just shut up and take the vaccine, that doesn't make them feel better and it doesn't take away their valid concerns. So open dialogue is very important and we should never stop people from being able to voice those concerns because they're valid. Now, an another Google thing it. that I've been shamed about recently is my quest to fall in love. And everybody knows oh. that I have the little spoon on the side, but I'm still in the drawer with a bunch of forks and knives too. So I'm trying to figure out how to safely date in COVID. And so I don't know mm. if any of you watching have any ideas or people that you'd like to slide in my DMs, but I'm out here, I'm open and, and I am screening them. So here's what I've come up with as my three forms of screening potential candidates. Number one, are you married or in another relationship? That's going to definitely be the first screen because I ain't dealing with that no more. Also, number two, do you have a recent COVID test? And do I think that it's been Photoshopped to meet the requirements? Move on to step three. And number three, are you going to bring any baggage in my life? I just am at a point where I lost all the weight. I got, I can't take your weight and your baggage into my life. So I don't know. I'm trying to date during COVID. What about you two? I think you're missing oh, one yeah. question, Jason. I think, I think the fourth question should be, um, is there somebody who'd be upset knowing that you and I are dating? Cause people can say they're single all they want and still have complications. And so I've learned to ask that caveat. Cause I was talking to somebody who was single and then I was like, wait, is there anybody who'd be upset that you're with me right now? And his whole face changed. Hmm. Well, I think that falls in the category don't have a relationship. Like, just don't be with nobody. I mean. No, you have to. You know, boys are clever. You have to be granular. You have to be granular with the you, you have know, to say, is there anybody who'd be upset? If you don't know that you're in a relationship, you probably should go to get therapy. I mean, you should probably get professional help because at this point, you should know. Now, Jason, there's a lot of men that's in relationships that don't know it. I yep. feel like personally, if you have sex with a woman more than four to five times consistently, you are in some type of relationship, whether you know it or not. Once you consistently have sex with a woman, I'm telling you, Jason, you might not know you're in a relationship, but she knows it. And it's going to cause some issues if you're talking about some, oh, I'm in a relationship now, a real one. She's like, uh, no, you ain't. <laughs> well, yeah, it can cause some complications. In my community, if you have sex more than once, you're in a relationship. Oh, oh. well, look at that. Okay. There you go. 
<laughs> Jason, you know <laughs> damn well that is not, you know what? You fell for that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, excuse me, go go ha go ask that question to the bathroom stall at the Abbey and then holler at me. Listen, we're going to have to close the door on this stall because we have Pastor Marvin Sapp coming up. And I just I'm glad that he hasn't logged in just yet because y'all yeah. led me down a path of no return. But I will return with the pastor. OK, listen, I know everybody knows I'm a heathen sometimes, but I'm trying to do better. And Although my book, God must have forgot about me, taught me that he didn't. I'm so glad to finally bring somebody here who I know has filled up my spiritual cup. And that is the Bishop Marvin Sapp. Listen, I have been a fan of yours for a long time. And, you know, I, I will say if my life had a song, it would have been never would have made it because literally wow. I wake up every day and feel like I never would have made it. So I'm so honored to have you here on the show. Welcome. Man, it is a great, great pleasure. I appreciate you guys uh, being patient as I was trying to figure this whole, you know, uh, social media technology thing. You know, uh, t it was it was tough, but we finally got here. Well, listen, it's OK. By the grace of God. Look, you know, what's crazy is I um, in my book, I talk about how I grew up in the foster care system. My foster father was a he was a pastor, um, Elder Easter. And you know, there's just something about anointed people, you know, when you're in their presence and then there's something when you're around people who, you know, anointings on their card, but not may, may not be in their life. So I know that you're one of those people that is anointed. Um, I, I've never gotten a chance to talk to you. So I just want to know, like in these times, when you look at the, the especially the last year, when you think about what's going on in the world, do you think there's a spiritual warfare happening? <laughs> absolutely absolutely i think the enemy is really trying to stop us from uh having this conversation but uh we're gonna press on in and and fight through it and see what happens right exactly and i don't know if it was co if it's covid donald trump when you look at the last let's just say the last four-year period do you what have you been able to tell your congregation or the people that you minister to on what we're actually experiencing because i know when uh when trump first got in office they said my friend uh, he said well you know this might be the last days and then the last couple years he was like oh jesus is on his way back <laughs> you know, to take us home. what have you been able to make how have you been able to make sense of this to the people that you lead i've been really just challenging them to just really think about you know, this time of isolation, seclusion, this time of quarantine as an opportunity for them to really be able to, you know, forecast their own futures. If, if you've had nothing, you've had a lot of time to redesign, to recalibrate, to rethink, you know, how you're going to live the rest of your life. And, you know, the reality is, is that based upon what has happened in the pandemic, tomorrow's not promised. So let's get started doing what we desire to do and uh, make sure that this is not a season of procrastination, but that you make a decision now to go get it. No, that's great because I also talk about, you know, you, you can't live by faith and fear at the same time. For me, I just choose to have faith. And even before the pandemic, you know, uh, I had a lot of ups and downs in my life, death of my brother, death of my mother, foster care, abuse, uh, molested, different things. And, I've, and, and you know, when you're going through the storm, you really don't know, you know, exactly what's happening. But when you when you when you understand faith and you learn faith, how can you be fearful that you're not going to make it through, you know? OK, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a very strong believer that faith isn't something that's like really big. The reality is, is that faith is just little incremental steps that we need to take in order to make sure that we get to the place that we desire to get, which is our ultimate goal. So I've been challenging. I've been challenging the people that I pastor and even those that watch me uh, via social media. You know, listen, I, in this season, you know, don't worry about the pace or how fast you get there. Uh, just make sure that you are consistently moving in the direction uh, that you can ultimately reach your goal, and that is what you desire to reach. So, you know, right now it's, it's not about big steps. It's not about major moves. It's it's just about making consistent movement forward. And if you do that, you know, the rest of your days will be the best of your days. Mm. I love that. I actually have a question for you about not necessarily faith, but grace. Um, like Jason mentioned, you're very anointed. When I listen to your music, I listen to your music a lot on Sundays when I'm cleaning. So I'm, geeking out, I'm geeking out right now um, because <laughs> Sunday is the day that I heal. Um, and you're such an instrumental part of people healing from you remotely. 
I can't even imagine what it's like to be around you on a regular basis, right? So for people like you who are healers, how do you, in the midst of all this adversity, stop yourself from burning out? Because I've often found myself wanting to help others heal, but to my own detriment. And I can imagine that you experienced that probably tenfold. Well, I, you know, first, I, I understand that, that I'm not a healer. Uh, I'm a conduit. In other words, okay. you know, I, I allow God to like to flow through me. And, you know, I've always, I try to the best of my ability, you know, be the vessel uh, that God wants to use and just try to get messaging out that will encourage people to get to that place. When you look at the last four years with Trump, um, are you one of those pastors that's out there telling his flock, don't y'all go there? Or do you stay neutral when it comes to politics? Because sometimes that could divide the congregation. And the second part to that is, when you look back over those last four years, <laughs> have you thought about the black church's role in um, maybe not guiding their congregations enough to maybe vote in a different way? Well, you know, I'm very different when it comes to uh, the political landscape, simply because a lot of people don't know uh, because I don't really publicize it. But I'm actually on the national board for the National Black Action Network. Mm. Um, oh. When it comes to my position as it pertains to, to politics, though, you know, I don't necessarily get up in the pulpit and share a whole lot of things as it pertains to direction that, you know, my members should vote or so on and so forth, because the truth of the matter is, is that I personally benefit and have benefited from the policies of what Trump has put in place. But at the same token, I don't pastor people that benefit from the policies. So because I don't pastor people that benefit from the policies uh, that Trump has made uh, from a from a tax standpoint, you know, I let them know. I'm like, look, you know, it's not just about voting your conscience. I believe personally that government is in place to help people. I don't believe that government is in place to, you know, uh, cause those of us who live in the one percentile to make more money. I believe the government is supposed to be there to help people. So I make sure I get up and I make those statements. I'm like, look, you know, am I pro-life? Absolutely, I'm pro-life, but I'm pro-life from birth to death. I'm not just pro-life as it pertains to in the womb. So it's it's more to it to me than when it comes to those types of things. And and I get up and I make sure that, you know, I express, you know, my opinion. I don't tell people who to vote for because I don't think that that's my responsibility. I've actually lost members because of the things that uh, I've shared over the pulpit. Uh, but at the same token, I just believe that we need to be informed as well as we need to use the pulpit because with all of the individuals that show up on Sunday, it gives us a real opportunity to speak truth to power. And hopefully, you know, people will take that which they hear, formulate their own concepts, thoughts, ideas, and then be able to, you know, exercise their God-given ability and authority by going out and effecting change through their vote. So, you know, that's I think that's a part of our responsibility as, you know, pastoral gifts. And I do it to the best of my ability. Because the re reason why I ask the question is, you know, we were living in times when I talk about spiritual warfare and just the, 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 the landscape of where we find ourselves in the world. When I think about some of the greatest people in the world, Dr. Martin Luther King is among those people at the top. He was a pastor and, you know, led a revolution that we're still fighting this day, although it seems like we've seen a lot of change. You know, we could see Kamala in the White House. We've seen Barack, but we still know with Black Lives Matter and George Floyd that issues that we faced back in the 60s and before have, are still uh, prevalent in today's uh, society. So when I look at the role of pastors, I, I tend to think like there are some who, you know, just have a reach and an influence over the masses. And I kind of wonder if there's ever the pressure to just really get in and lead that way? Or do you, or do they mm. find themselves just ministering in the way that they, you know, that the gift shows up for them? Well, I think, you know, everybody has a specific assignment. Every Everybody's not, you know, supposed to be out, it, from a pastoral standpoint right. too, everybody's not supposed to be out there in the forefront. You know, some of us are not equipped to do it. You know, uh, the reason why, you know, I work with, you know, uh, Al Sharpton and, 
you know, my thing is behind the scenes. I know, you know, if he needs me to do something from the standpoint of musical, you know, or musically rather, you know, to sing or to do something like that, that's, that's part of my assignment to make sure that we bring the entertainment piece uh, to that galvanizing message. Um, you, you really have to know your place. Uh, everybody's not assigned to be in the forefront. Mm -hmm. Some of us can try to push our way to that platform and then get out there and make some real fools of ourselves and make ourselves look horrible as a, you know, colored African-American community. Um, so know your space, know your place and play your role. Everybody can't be the quarterback. Everybody cannot be the quarterback. We need folks to be linemen. We need people mm -hmm. to be on the return team. We need people to be on the kickoff team. So once you understand your place and understand your position, just play it well. That's what I do. I just play my position. Yeah, well as I, I, possibly can. I like that because we had Al Sharpton here on the show and he said something similar to that because I said, oh, would you be a part of Biden's cabin? And he said, no, I affect more change on the outside. So I'm going to stay on yeah. the outside. And I think what makes him such a good leader and what makes you such a good pastor and musician is you know where you fit in it all. And I think that, you know, I've even struggled with my own role in the Black Lives Matter movement. I want to be right in on the front line, but then I think, well, hey, I got this platform with an audience so I can play the outside and just keep sharing and elevating the message. And I'm still as much an integral part of change as the people on the front line. So I, that, that's, um, I appreciate that. Well, you know, everybody, it's a puzzle and every guy, everybody has to know where they fit. So, mm -hmm. you know, Sometimes, you know, because we're younger, younger people don't get it. But after being here 54 years, you know, I, I really understand uh, where where it is that I'm supposed to be. And and I just believe that I play my part pretty good. <laughs> Next, I have a question wanna... about the mechanics. Oh, sorry, Jason. I just had a quick question about the mechanics of what you do. Now that it's COVID, are you guys still having service in person or how is that? going because there's there's something so great about being surrounded by people when you want to worship but i would think that right now that's kind of complicated for you guys our church stayed closed for a very long time and when i say the church stayed closed i mean the building um because i'm a strong believer that the church has never closed uh the only thing that has happened is that the pews have changed mm. now the pews are in the homes Mm -hmm. uh, so what we did is, is we went and made sure that we updated our entire ministry. I ripped out the entire pulpit area, got rid of the choir stand, put LED wall in, uh, made it so that it was visually appealing as well as I made sure uh, that the content of that which we shared was impactful and empowering as well. So um, we wanted to make sure that, the, that our membership that watched that they enjoyed it. Because the truth of the matter is, is that everybody is now online. Everybody is Facebook living. Everybody is Instagram living. So we needed to make sure that our ministry was, you know, up to snuff and up to par. And, and we did a did a, a really, really good job and a lot of hard work to ensure that that happened. We have a team to come in and they, uh, you know, sanitize the entire sanctuary all of the bathrooms, everything. People have to wear masks. Um, mm -hmm. We have Purell stations all over the place. We take temperatures. We go through that every week. I mean, we average on Sunday 100,000 views. So there's no way possible I can get all of those folk in a 1500 <laughs> seat church anyway. So the impact during this season to me has been far greater for churches across the board yeah. Because we've been able to minister to larger crowds on an ongoing basis. So I kind of feel like, you know, even though the pandemic was a bad thing, the truth of the matter is, is I, I kind of feel like it sparked an, an amazing revival. That was going to be my question. Um, we look at 2020 as the worst year in decades, but I hate dwelling on the negative. And I wanted to see from your point of view, how has 2020 inspired you and what has that year impacted uh, what you do as a pastor? or as an entertainer? Um, it put me in a position where I had to reimagine what church really looked like and how church was going to be done. And to me, honestly, it was fun. Uh, fun trying to figure out new and innovative ways in order to 
uh, message or send a message to the masses. As an entertainer, for the last, I've been doing this for 32 years professionally. Mm. I've averaged being on a plane twice a week for the last 32 years. I've flown almost 7 million miles on Delta Airline alone. I needed this break. So, <laughs> so I'm good. You know, I was like, hey, listen, you know, I'm all right. You know, I saved money. I put money away. So, you know, over the last year. That, that's the thing. You know, that's the thing. Although it's been tragic for a lot, it, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a blessing to slow down because you didn't, you probably didn't even realize, like, I can only imagine your life, but we didn't even realize how much we were running until our body was forced to stop and our mind was still running. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's been a blessing in many ways too. Mm -hmm. It's been, I mean, you know, I have no complaints. I'm going to be honest. You know, I missed a lot of money. I'm going to be honest about that. But I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the break, the rest, um, the ability to recalibrate, uh, to think things through, to really be able to write down stuff, forecast things, and what it taught me is I should have did this a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Speak on it. I shouldn't have had to be forced to do it. And, I, and, and sometimes I think that's what God is trying to get us all to understand, that we're so busy being so fast paced and doing things and always trying to be busy, trying to be a boss, you know, trying to secure the bag. You know, I think we've lost focus on what life is really about. And sometimes we just need to rest and reflect. And that's what, you know, 2020 did for me. It gave me an opportunity to rest and reflect. I grew up in the black church um, and this is no shade towards the churches that aren't black, but some of these pastors have been doing a lot. I look at Joel Osteen when we had the whole crisis happen where he lo uh, locked the people out the church. I guess they had, they had that disaster, didn't open up the church. Then I remember the other guy who was on the 700 club. I can't remember his name, but uh, he was, uh, you know, basically saying that I think he was saying that COVID wasn't real or something to that extent, really dangerous rhetoric. And then I look at our black pastors who you've done everything from redesign the church to pivoting online to doing temperature checks, RSVP to make sure everybody's safe. That goes back to what I said at the top of the show. I know when I'm talking to somebody anointed, I know when somebody's here for the bag. What, what do you think that is? Do you think that that's pastors like a lot of those that were in texas uh, and they happen to be white pastors who were uh, uh wanting the churches to be open so everybody can fill up the pews um because they were preaching to a more conservative base and that's what their people wanted to hear or were they just afraid of or lacking leadership what was that you know most african-american pastors that i know as soon as covid hit you know we directly we got directly connected to the cdc we wanted to find out information we wanted to get emails i'm talking about pastors who were serious about ensuring the safety of their flock. One of the greatest blessings of, of the church that I pastor um, is that, you know, we had people to have COVID, but out of 1,300 active members, no one passed away. That's wow. a blessing. Um, but that's because I believe because we were really, really proactive. So, you know, the truth of the matter is, is they can have church because it wasn't affecting them. Mm -hmm. I, yep. that's just the truth the truth is is that it wasn't it wasn't mm -hmm. hitting them you know the way it was hitting our community so of course we had to take a different look at it you know when it happened we shut it down I mean it was like no no nobody can come to the church you know if the praise team if anybody had a, a elevated fever because uh my pastor of music and arts he had COVID um he couldn't come to the church until he was cleared uh, we did certain things strategically in order to ensure and to make sure that everybody was safe. You know, we told all of our senior members, stay home. Listen, we made sure that the grandchildren taught them how to get on YouTube, taught them how to get on uh, Facebook, uh, taught them how to give electronically because, you know, they still carry checkbooks and they still, mm -hmm. you know, give cash. So we taught them certain things that they needed to do in order to, you know, still stay connected to the church. And now they've gotten so comfortable, which is, is funny. They've gotten so comfortable watching, uh, 
you know, on streaming. My head deacon told me he might not ever come back to church again. He's enjoying it so much. So, so I'm like, man, you know, this, you know, so it's it's all about again recreating uh and teaching people new stuff. I mean, you know, uh we had no choice. Um, in order to keep people safe, in order to keep them healthy, uh, we had to do things that our white counterparts just didn't have to do. Mm. Can I just thank you for making that point? Because um, what Jason touched on and what you brilliantly brought home was the fact that um, America has the worst COVID rates, right? This is the worst yeah. way to be make America great again. However, we all know that when America gets a cold, the black community gets a flu. Yeah, and so we don't or have cancer. the luxury. Yeah, we get <laughs> cancer, right? We don't have the luxury cancer. of playing these games because anything bad that happens in this country only highlights the disproportionate amounts of healthcare that we don't have, the money that we don't have, the food deserts that we do have. And so, to your point, the black church has been the backbone and doesn't have the luxury to play with us the way a lot of white churches do. And that's an ugly reality that a lot of conservatives don't want to admit when they're screaming from the pulpit that COVID isn't real. So thank you for being part of the backbone of this country and making up for the fact that the government often doesn't do what the church does for us. That's just facts. And that's what we, and that's why it's so very important that we, we remain informed. Thank you for that. Now you mentioned, you mentioned cancer. I know your wife who I didn't have the pleasure of meeting Melinda Sapp uh, passed away of cancer in 2010. Now I will tell you, and I've been waiting to meet you to tell you this, and, and I hope this don't sound weird, but I have watched videos from your wife's home going repeatedly, Karen Clark, um, all the different artists that got up there. I mean, if there was ever a home going done perfectly, I, I just think that you did such an amazing job. When you look back over those videos, I don't know if you still do, are you amazed at how God was really working through that room because the the music ministry was just beyond for me. You, you know, that day is, is, is kind of fuzzy. And, uh, you know, the story, you know, I met my wife in the third grade. <laughs> we went to elementary school, middle school, high school. We double dated for the senior prom. She went with another guy. I went with another girl. Um, we were best friends, man, in every sense of the word. And, the song that you love never would have made it. The only reason why you heard it is because she nagged until I put it on the record. That's the truth. I didn't decide to put it on the record until the day we recorded it. Uh, because I, God, God gave me that song on a Sunday morning. Just It was after my father had passed away. And uh, I just stood in the pulpit getting ready to preach and tears rolling down my face because I had just buried my father on that Thursday. And I just started singing those words. I never would have made it. I never could have made it without you, God. I would have lost my mind. But now how I see how you've been there for me. And after this, I'm going to be stronger, wiser, better. And my wife kept telling me, this is it, babe. You need to record this. I'm like, no, this ain't even a whole song. The song is never would have, never could have, stronger, wiser, better. And she pushed, 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 pushed. And I finally just said, okay, look, I'm going to put it at the end of the record and just to appease you. And, uh, you know, 15 years later, believe it or not, that song is 15 years old. Mm. Um, it's still very relevant. I miss her dearly. I really do because, you know, she was, she was my best friend. Um, and uh, she was, she was really ride or die in every sense of the word. You know, my kids miss her. Uh, we had to, I had to raise three children, 11, 13, and 16, you know, by myself and uh, two girls and a boy, two girls. That's all I got to say. I, I and, already know. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but, but, but they have done very well. They're 26, 23, and 21. Uh, all of them, you know, my son went to Howard. My daughters, they both go to Alabama a and You know, my, my two oldest, they got their bachelor's degrees. Uh, my daughter's in her master's program. My baby girl, she's doing uh, her second bachelor's degree. Um, she has one in psych and one in uh, biology, and she'll be through in May because she's planning on going to medical school. So, I mean, they've done very well in the midst of all of that. Uh, you know, musically, you know, the gospel music community, we're friends. And when one of us goes through, we all go through. So you know, I just really appreciate the fact that they were all there. Kirk was there, Karen was there, Commission was there, 
you know, Dorinda, all of them. They were all there. Even those that didn't sing, they were just I think, there. I think I've seen Donnie McClurkin singing behind Karen. Yeah, Don Donnie sang background and Marvin Wine and sang back. I mean, so it was just, it was an amazing moment. And, you know, you need those, you need those. And in, in times like that, you really need to have people that genuinely care about your well being to be there. And uh, even though it was even though it was fuzzy, were you a, were you able to feel the love in the room though? Because I mean, oh, absolutely, 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 the love was in the room. I mean, you know, my kids and I, you know, we cried, we cried a lot. But one thing I learned, and if, if this is one of the things I want to leave with you guys, you know, just because people show up to be at an event, the true friends are those that's there after everything is done mm -hmm. and i can honestly say that donnie yep. and and karen and all of those kirk all of them they consistently checked on me made sure that you know i was in a safe space mentally you know my wife was a clinician so you know it was easy for me and my kids to go into therapy um which is something that we don't talk about in the black community or the black church which i believe that is a conversation we absolutely need to have Especially after COVID, we definitely need to make sure that we're getting some counseling uh, to deal with the depression and the anxiety that many of us are feeling. Um, but at the same token, I thank God for good friends, real friends. You know, that song never would have made it. Um, Leandria Johnson's been on the show. She's another one of my favorites. I know when she honored you at the BMI Awards and she was on that ground. And then you look over to the side and you see Yolanda in the cut. And that's a whole bunch of pressure to keep performing. But you know what I love about um, what I love about Leandria the most is that she really is reflective of all of us as humans. Like we go through things, we have our ups and downs. And I think sometimes the black church is not as forgiving as it should be. And so I do love the fact that people like you embrace her and that, uh, you know, we, we understand that, you know, this life is a journey and it's not a, a it's not a perfect journey. It's a storm that we had to figure out how to navigate through sometimes. So when she performed that song for you, did you get, did you pick her to do it or did they pick her to do it? Cause she was literally the perfect person to do that. Well, they picked it when, when they honored me for the BMI honors. I mean, they, I mean, you get surprised by a whole lot of stuff when, when those events happen. So I came in, and I was just there. I didn't know what they were singing. I didn't know anything. So when she came out and started singing, never would have made it. I was like, okay, Leandria, you know, <laughs> I know, I know what you're about to do to my song. But I just really, I just really, I really hope that you don't don't do it so bad that I can never sing it again. And then she transitioned and went to that I made it thing. And I just lost my mind. I was like, at that point. I was like, this is just ridiculous. Nobody should be able to sing like this. And also, by the way, uh, Marvin, I saw that you they released that as a single, so you still got your coin. So regardless if she oversang it or not, you still got paid. And as we prepare for this show, my whole house was playing your version and her version, and either way, you got paid. So you won both. Listen, hey, the, 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 I'll tell anybody this. I'll tell anybody. Never would have made is the song that keeps on giving. It's the song that keeps on giving. You, uh, uh, who did it? Who else did it? Uh, uh, Tiana Taylor. Mm. Yeah, she did. Tiana Taylor did it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Little Wayne actually sampled it and put it wow. in one of his songs. I didn't tell nobody about that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, but 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 when the record company called me, right? This is funny. The record company <laughs> called so me. Said, I love it. They said, they said Little Wayne. A uh, sample never would have made it and want to put it in one of his songs. We need to clear it. And uh, they sent me the song. They said, now nah, it's going to have some cussing in it because it was on the Carter Five. And it's going to have some cussing in it. Da, 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 da. And so they wanted me to hear it. So I'm listening to it and I'm listening to it. I'm listening to it. I'm listening to it. And then my record company executive said, whoa, you all right with that? And I said, I didn't hear nothing but cha-ching, ching, cha-ching, ching, ching. ching, 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 ching. <laughs> I am not all mad. I, all I heard was, was, was dollar signs and change. The, I couldn't but hear them. But the power in that, though, is that, you're, you know, there is a gospel influence, even with Jesus Walks with Kanye. That's it. Yolanda mm -hmm. performing. Like, this is the thing that I always say. 
And I love Karen. Karen Clark, you know I love you. If you're watching, please adopt me. I feel like <laughs> you're going to get the newer generation, the younger generation. You got to, there has to be a bridge. And I and I believe that music is the ministry that's going to do it. And so there's Absolutely. probably, like with Tana Taylor and Lil Wayne, there's a whole generation of people listening to that music, researching to find out and connect, making a mm -hmm. connection for them. So I think it's a blessing. It is. It is. And, you know, you know, sometimes people in the church can be so, you know, stiff and rigid um, that they they hear stuff like, you know, the remix. Never would have made it ne when they do that thing. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, they get stiff about it. And it's like, how do you feel? I said, I think it's great. It and they great. Say, what do you do? I said, absolutely. I think that's amazing because what they don't realize is that the message, you know, even though they're remixing it and even though people... Uh, like DJ Cali sampled it and, you know, all these different individuals are sampling this music that I've done. My conviction and my initial message as it pertains to it hasn't changed. So, you know, I just look at it like, you know, God's just extending my reach mm -hmm. and uh, giving me influence in arenas that, you know, I may not get the opportunity to go in physically, but my music does. So I'm, I've enjoyed yeah. it, man. I think it's funny and fun. My kids thought that now that's funny. My kids, they think this is the dopest thing on the planet, man. They think that, like, you know, and it's your, and it's your wife showing up like I told you, you know. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. It, that's exactly what it's like. You know, my wife is like, I, I know, you know, she's looking down. It's like Negro, see, see, you, like, yeah. you know, you talk about I'm nagging, but look, you know, you still getting, you still getting your coins in the end, ain't you? So it's been a blessing, man. It's really been a blessing that you know God has allowed. Again, the song I recorded 15, 16 years ago. No, I think what you said is powerful. I mean, music is the ultimate transcender and connector of people. Me, I grew up in Islam and. That song is one of my favorite songs and it touches me to my core. And it doesn't matter what religion you follow, what your background is, what your age is. When you have a good message and it comes from an organic place, it, it fills you up like that. And that's what that song does. So I'm just I'm still at all that we're talking to you right now. But thank you and thank you to your late wife for encouraging you to record that song. You know, that's what Callie told me. Callie told me the same thing. He told me, said, man, the reason why. I want to put this, I want to sample this and put this in this song is because you don't really realize how universal your message has been across ethnicities and across, you know, spirituality and spiritual lives. Now, we know versus battle has been a big deal online. If you had to go head to head with somebody in the versus battle, who, who would it be? Wow. Uh-huh. You know, I've been doing this for so long. I don't know. Um, basically, basically, he just said, they don't want to see me. Nobody. That's <laughs> <one test. laughs> I, mean, That's I you know, because you know, I got 13, I got 13 albums, and it's not it's not a whole lot of artists in Flex. gospel that got 13 records. You know what I'm saying? So, so, basically, what he just said was, check my discography before you ask me a question like that. That's a flex, Mr. Sapp. That is it. a flex. Got okay. But <laughs> I don't I just, you know, I never thought about it. You know, I was a part of Fred Hammond and Kirk's. I was there just to support. And they called me in to sing Never Would Have Made It. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I just don't think, you know, no, I'll put it this way. No matter what, if I close out, would never would have made it. The battle is over. It's over. And then you know what? Let me let me take let me tell you the mic drop. After you close it out, you say, "Listen, now the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. I'm out." And you just walk out the room. <laughs> shut the door. Just shut it down. It just shut it down. But I've enjoyed it. I actually I watch them. I mean, I you know, I think uh, which one did I like the most? Patty. Uh, I love Patty's. Patty's was was good, I, but I enjoyed like uh, Ashanti and um, I've been, I enjoyed it. I did not okay. expect that. Okay, uh, hold on, hold on. Pa Pastor, this has been a non shady show. We're gonna leave it right there on the floor. Because uh, I prayed before I came in here, I, I put on never would have made it. I had to make sure that the house was filled with the spirit. Don't start nothing. We almost out of here. Okay. I I I, I I but I like music, so of course I enjoyed it because I like it. 
just let me ask you okay. your your the, 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 your new album chosen vessel now talk to us about that and because of course we're all going to get it we're excited to hear new music from you what are we what are we going to see on uh, here on that album is are there people on there that we know yeah you know it's just me you know i, I i've been my whole career i've never done like uh guests and the reason why is because you know if 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 the song that you do with a guest is your hit it makes it extremely difficult for you to travel and perform it. Yeah. Um, so I've always done, not that I'm selfish. I just like to do projects, you know, by myself. I tell people all the time. I mean, you know, Marvin Sapp, my goal is always the same whenever I do a record. And that is to keep it churchy and funky all at the same time. Mm-hmm. And if I can do that, you know, I accomplish my goal musically. So, you know, this record, you know, actually, I got some uh, some trap on it. Um, this record, oh. you know, you're going to get the traditional uh, signature Marvin Sapp stuff as well. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did a trap song we, called I Pray. We, it's, it's we, need, to know, we need to know what the Marvin Ooh. Sapp trap sound like. Let, what is Marvin, <laughs> Marvin Sapp? Just listen to it. Listen, it's a song. It's, it's the second song on the record. It's called Our Praise. It's going to bless you. Really, really. You're going to like it. He said it's, it's going to bless, bless you. you. It's going to bless you. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you right now. Get your merch together. Marvin Trap. Hey. <laughs> Yo. I, like I kind of like that. I like that. I like it. Yeah, I like I that. Like that. All right. Well, listen, I'm excited for it. I, and again, it's an honor to be able to talk to you. And like I said, I, I, your music, there, there are, you know, I'm a, um, I, I, there, like Kanye stuff, I can get with some of that his stuff because he's just a musical genius. But for me, the music, if it's not anointing, if it's not coming from somebody who's anointed, if it doesn't have the spirit and I can't listen to it, you are one of the few that are in my phone on repeat. Um, so I'm contributing to them streaming dollars, cha-ching. And, uh, you know, you can always come back here. We appreciate you. And again, honored to talk to you. Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate you guys taking time out your schedule. And thank you. Thank you again. Uh, let me throw this out. You know, this is what we always do. Follow me on all of my social media platforms. You can follow me on the official Marvin Sapp page on Facebook, or you can follow me on Twitter and or Instagram at Marvin Sapp. Absolutely. And uh, matter of fact, Kelvin, let's make some Marvin Trap. Let's make a Marvin Trap sweater. Marvin we Trap. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Grace peace to y'all, man.